Okay, I think uh, I don't have the exact exact time, but yeah, 10.02. Some people still will uh, join now, but I guess we can uh, start right away. So welcome everyone who made it to our uh, session, Mobility Data Spaces in the Gaia X context. Um, we have two very nice speakers with us, Chris Leng from Deutsche Telekom. Uh, Sebastian Steinbus uh, from the IDSP head office, our CTO. Um, myself, I'm Christoph Mertens, I'm the head of adoption of IDSA, and here with me, Marcos. Hi, everyone. Welcome from my side as well. Marcos Matzas, also head office and adoption team. Yeah, and um, the next 60 minutes will be about mobility, about data spaces, about IDS, about Gaia. And uh, Marcos, it would be great if you could uh, show us a bit more about the agenda. I put on the right slide. Great. And here we have the agenda. So um, after a first uh, welcome from our side, uh, we're going to go to introduction uh, about mobility data spaces from Chris Lanton from Deutsche Telekom. We're going to hear all about uh, um, everything that is happening out there, some very nice um, um, endeavors and uh, examples. And then we're going to go into a discussion and uh, a presentation from our CTO, Sebastian Steinbus, about how mobility uh, data spaces can be IDS based and also GAIAS compliant and how this um, is really happening. And um, after a Q&A, we're going to go back to us where we will present uh, a bit uh, the, the, the new series of data spaces dialogues and stay with us because we have some very nice uh, events planned for you for the rest of the year, but also uh, for later. But um, I would say before we go to the intro of mobility data space, it would be great if we, 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 we could uh, first hear a bit uh, more about um, a new alliance that uh, we um, formed together with Gaia, EDVA, and Fiverr, uh, we as idea saving here, and it's great, Christoph, if, if you could give us um, a bit uh, more information on that. People that follow us probably have heard the news, but obviously our audience would like to share more. Sure thing. Um, maybe before some uh, small housekeeping, you're muted by default. Um, you can raise questions any point at any point in time in the question section at the right side, uh, I think, depending on where you have your um, go to meeting panel, there is a question section, drop your questions in there. Uh, feel free to do that uh, at any point in time. We'll get back to you at the Q&A slot towards the end uh, or, um, of the session. Um, if you, during the Q&A, want to uh, talk to us and uh, raise questions verbally and get into a discussion, please raise your hand so we can unmute you. That's also an option then later. So, uh, as Marco said, Data Spaces, uh, Data Spaces Business Alliance um, is a new alliance that was announced, I think, last week, Friday, the um, press release uh, got online. Um, it's the alliance of um, maybe the four largest initiatives currently dealing with um, the topic of data spaces governance on European level. Um, we have with us the Big Data Value Association. Um, the PPP, that is the bridge between research of European Commission and the industry. We have with us um, the Fireware Foundation, um, who provide uh, a great framework for data uh, sharing. We have um, Gaia X ASBL with us and also international data spaces. Um, ourselves are part of this liaison. Um, what is this new liaison, this association, um, this um, alliance? doing now. So basically, uh, we can say the strategy um, goes into four or, or uh, covers four main directions. Um, first of all, it's about joining forces. <clears throat> what we did not um, realize only last week, but already since a long time, is that uh, in order to have a standard that European-wide uh, will be a de facto standard that is embraced by the industry and used um, we have to join forces. It's not worth to create uh, several different smaller standards where one sub-community, maybe even from a certain domain, makes use of um, one standard, another domain makes use of another standard. Um, this is maybe also something that Chris and Sebastian will go into details while talking about mobility data spaces 
in more detail. Um, even though we now talk about mobility, uh, we will um, see in a, a few minutes, I think, that the uh, collaboration with also other domains makes a lot of sense. In mobility case, Chris, maybe you will get to this example. Um, just think about e-mobility and the uh, um, uh, cross links towards the energy sector where both uh, domains could um, really have benefits sharing um, their data in one standard. Um, another thing is sharing the expertise. So uh, all of the four initiatives have different kinds of expertises. So from research, from um, uh, a more adoption-driven point of view with frameworks, with implementations. So, um, and the member base, which is the, um, uh, also a point here on this list, um, is so huge and the, the knowledge within these large networks is um, highly recommended uh, to make use of um, while creating standards. Um, this is what the IDSA already does since a long time, Gaia also, uh, BDVA and uh, Fireware, and now bringing this together, this knowledge to one uh, voice that um, creates this one de facto standard for the market will be a key um, issue of the Data Spaces Business Alliance. Um, yeah, maybe we have some more interactive discussions later on today. I would I would say with this short intro to this new alliance, uh, we hand over to Chris. And Chris, I would be glad uh, we would be glad to know more about your view on data spaces in the mobility sector. I know that it does not only melt down to mobility data space uh, the project. I know that you have a really broad view on these things, and I'm glad to know more about it now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction here. Yeah, it's an honor, pleasure being here today. And let me quickly switch over to the presentation that I've prepared. Yeah. So can you see my screen? We can, full yes. screen presentation. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Sure. So it's an honor actually to talk about it. And as you can imagine, the key challenge is I get 20, 25 minutes actually talk about mobility data space. So there's so much actually to talk about actually, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll present you today um, together with Sebastian Steinbus. He is the chief architect of IDSA. I'm coming from Deutsche Telekom. I'm involved in an effort that's the Telecom Data Intelligence Hub um, out of now the T-Systems. Uh, business unit, and what is it? What is it that I can possibly deliver in 20, 25 minutes? Um, so let me start out with how you should start out with. Well, what is really the problem, right? If you do data spaces, what is the problem that is being addressed, right? And so that's what I want to do. And I'm going to take two perspectives actually. I'm going to come top down. So it's a macro perspective, what's the macro problem that is being solved? And then we also kind of open the foot and peek under it and look at it bottom up essentially, right? And that's the next item where I can uh, give you a little insights, peaks and glimpses at mobility data spaces in action. And that is actually new too, because now indeed the first data spaces, they are happening mobility and those mobility data spaces are in action. And then you're gonna raise the issue and wh where do we go from here? Right, you know, it, it, it took a while actually to get where we are. Now suddenly this thing is starting up, it's warming up. So where will this whole thing go? So that is, so that's what I would like to do. And let me let me jump into this right away. And what I want to use here is actually not material that has been done in some labs or whatever, but I, I will draw heavily now my presentation on material that has evolved in an effort that is an IDS community, and specifically it's the IDS mobility. Uh, community and that is something toward the end we'll have a call to action it is not some you know exclusive club for just very few no it is actually something that all of you can participate actually right and you'll find this on the home page of international data spaces communities and let me zoom quickly into the mobility community uh, very exciting day too we have a whole new publication it's an anthology it's data moves people a living a living a collection of highly relevant uh, articles on problems in mobility data spaces. I will selectively just draw from that. So let me get started. What What is the very big problem? Looking at this at 30,000 foot altitude in the mobility sector, we do witness nothing short but an industry transformation, 
right? You hear about it, how the emphasis in automotive is shifting from hardware to software. The question is, why does anybody do this, right? Why do you move to software, right? Well, because you will make money differently, right? Um, the money you'll be making more will, will be will be made through service offerings, right? And in order to economize services, you need software automation to do this. So you have a shift to software to enable a revenue shift to services, and all of that, all of that requires the fuel, and the fuel in this case is actually data. And it is very important. It hap has already happened, and you know you, you don't have to believe me. Just you know. Look at the stock markets and, and look at uh, the, the return on invest and what you see in terms of market capitalization, the data companies are beating everything else, basically. So that's a fact in essence, right? So data is the fuel for growth, for, for good market capitalization and for, and for heavy return on investment. So now, well, how well is it going with data actually, right? If we ask ourselves, how well are we doing with data? Well. If I look at data, well, it's a catastrophe, really, right? It's it, it's a debacle, right? You know, data is essentially broken. How do we know? We track the time spent in data analytics project. And if you break it down into results and everything else, what you find out is that 80% of the time is spent, or some would say wasted, right, on data, and only 20% on results. So if you believe in the Pareto, uh, principle of efficient business, getting to 80% of the effort, we're just running a bit of reverse data, actually, right? So it's pretty bad, actually, right? It's bad. So now the question is, if it's bad today, will it be better tomorrow, right? Does that even scale what we're doing? And well, you can already know the answer, right? But if you pick your own data there, right? I, I, I used a consensus, a consensus trend here. And if you believe the numbers we are today at 2%, at not even 2% of the data of the next 15 years. So bottom line, bottom line, what we do with data is actually broken, right? So if you go back to the initial change shift from hardware to software, software to, to service revenue, and you know, data fuel, well, it's broken actually. So we have to rethink fundamentally how we deal with data. And how do we do it? How do we do it? Well, we reverse how we have been operating with data. Today, all the data that you want to process in an application, let's say an algorithm, optimization algorithm, has to be pooled. You have to all consolidate it, and then you literally have to move it into an algorithm, right? And now with the amount of data, the explosion of data coming, that is not really broke. So the idea is to say, hey, why don't we leave the data where it is, right? So we've seen it in other in other domains too, the internet. We had a centralized system, right? We moved to a federated, a distributed system, right? That is now, you know, in fancy terms that is nowadays referred to as Web3. So distributed. And we do know the same with data. And this is where we finally arrive at the notion of a data space. That's what a data space is. It is a federated data system. Now, all good. Well, what are the problems? Well, you know, the, the key problem with data is that typically there are rights attached to data. Well, you know it, right? Your own profile data, right? You, you don't want to just hand it out to anybody, right? You want to make sure it's dealt with properly, right? So somehow any federated data system has to have a mechanism so that whoever has rights to the data doesn't lose them the moment you make the data available, you share the data, you exchange the data in a federated system. So that is that is essentially the market problem. Data is broken, but it does need a different approach. And this is what data spaces actually can 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 deliver, actually. Right. So that's the top line. And let me let me let me come from bottom up actually to, to maybe make that actually very very specific hit at home, you know, essentially, let me do this by giving you an overview of the various projects that, that the Data Intelligence Hub team is involved in. So I'm myself responsible for uh, mobility and automotive. We have a range of different uh, projects, um, some actually from government initiatives such as MPM. And that is also very exciting. Today is October 7. And we have a big event for many of the data space, and particularly in mobility activities. We have a big event coming up next week. It is the International, um, the ITS World Congress in Hamburg. Um, and it is the stage where many, many um, 
forward-looking project will be presented. One project in particular is something called Real Labo Hamburg. Um, it is the lab environment developed out of the National Platform for Future of Mobility, sponsored by the German government. It's a think tank. The idea was here to develop a way forward with mobility to make sure that Germany with a strong automotive business can also lead in future next mobility. And uh, the results, the results of this expansive laboratory will be presented at the ITS World Call next week and will, will be included too. Uh, our team uh, will actually present an intermodal travel planning app and more on that a little bit later, powered by a data space. So we will see the first use cases powered, built on data spaces using IDS technology. And there's also a, another effort um, that got started out of the Auto Summit last year, October, with the German Chancellor. It is now called the Mobility Data Space. It got organized by Architect, built by Fraunhofer Consortium. And that also will be presented with a whole range of exciting use cases at the ITS World Congress. So we'll, I'll give you a few glimpses into what will be presented actually, what we will present actually here. So there's a whole range of, of activities in the mobility space. We have some initially triggered from government activities, others now, and that's the latest example that got added, is now driven by industry players, specifically the Catena X initiative, all the German automakers have come together, BMW, uh, Daimler, Mercedes-Benz, and Volkswagen, together with strong leading tier one suppliers in order to create a data value system for the entire sector, all based on Gaia-X and IDS uh, technology. So that's just an over, and now we're gonna pick one project in particular, the one actually that we have been building in Realabo, which will be presented actually next week. And so what is the operational problem that is being addressed in this particular project? Well, it is something called in Germany, the word is Verkehrswende, you know, climate change, we've got to do something about it, we've got to do, you know, we're going to dramatically reduce CO2 emissions. So what are we gonna do? We gotta get people out of their cars into public transportation. At Hamburg as a city, has stated publicly a goal. They want to increase the share of trips that are being done by public transport from 22% of all trips to 30%. It doesn't sound like much, but this is an earthquake. Actually, it's a very big shaft, eight percentage points. So how? So the idea is getting people out of their cars. Well, yes, that is that. That's kind of you know it yourself probably. Wow, it'll take something actually to convince people. The future is how, how do we do this with a more attractive transportation offering essentially. Right? You, you, you either force people or you provide a better product. And a better product could emerge from something that is in the industry referred to as intermodal travel. Right? Intermodal travel, um, you, you orchestrate you know, different modes of transportation into a seamless end-to-end -end chain from point A to point B. And if this is well done, it does all the good things. It reduces CO2 emissions because pulling vehicles out of it, right? It is increasing travel times actually for the user and it is reduced, it can reduce costs because we use existing assets, you know, adding new cars, you know, have to be financed and maintained and what have not. We we reuse existing assets. So there is opportunity to actually be even cheaper. And then, of course, the comfort, right? You, you, you don't have to drive anymore. You're chauffeured, essentially, right? You can do email and all of that. So, so that, 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 that there, are, there are great incentives. And, you know, let me actually go to another uh, publication, actually, that, that, that we use here in, in this context, go straight to the anthology. It is not only that we can generate benefits, that we can generate benefits for the end user in terms of speed and comfort, but from a provider perspective, there's a clear win-win scenario. You can increase margins whenever you can actually offer the market comfort and advantage. Think about airline travel, not just economy, but that's economy premium or economy plus. Some of the market will decide to go for this and that's immediately a margin opportunity for providers. And that is very true even in, even in transportation. So now, what are now the operational problems, right? What are now the operational problems? What is, what is preventing intermodal offers currently? Well, the one problem is, is that today, it's just not very convenient. 
right? It's very complicated. I have so many apps, right? You know, I counted, I have like 27 apps that I use for bond travel, 17, air travel 10. And then think about all the things that can possibly go wrong, like data leaks. Do I, I'm full, am I fully in control of my data? I don't know. Every, with every provider, it's always the same. What's my ad with my credit card, what are my preferences, and so on, actually. Right? It's very tedious to do it. So it's complicated. It's too inconvenient. So it's much easier to use the car, and in the end, you have no motor shift. So one, one step toward solving that particular problem is to consolidate everything into one app, and we do see this. We do this in Berlin. Uh, BVG has now in ELB in Hamburg. Uh, we're working with Hamburger Hofer in Realabor. Um, they made the effort and created Switch. Um, that, that is an application that's consolidating access to different modes of transportation. And, and that is already a very good step, right? There's a lot less interaction, this is one. But there may be one issue if you end up wanting to use this thing. And that is that, you know, coming from airline traffic, I want to see the Star Alliance treatment. What I really want is if I book something with this new app, I want that app to know that I have a particular status, right? The membership advantages with the various other providers involved. Right? Why would I book a ticket on a platform that doesn't know that I get a discount with one of the mobility solutions involved in this new chain? Right? I, Langdon, have a subscription with Tia. I save the unlock fee. Well, if that doesn't get recognized, I'm going to pay more. So without the membership recognition, what we have is if there's no user discount, no modal shift, no revenue, and we end up in a lose-lose scenario. So it's very critical for these services to work that those providers share vital information and they have to share data that is very very sensitive and that it's presenting itself as a very true data sovereignty problem why would why would the provider share the the most valuable data customer data with a competitor right why would anybody do this right well number one is you you may look at the win-win scenario and you maintain control of the data and this is where we're getting back to where we're getting back to the data space so this is now coming bottom up from from from, from a real business case um, we arrive at the same property that we arrived at the macro level right at the macro level we gotta meet a distributed data infrastructure because there's just too much data Currently, the work with data is broken. We gotta find a solution that's scaling a lot better. And now coming bottom up actually from a new mobility solution, in this case, intermodal travel, that requires actually to solve the data sovereignty challenge that is currently inhibiting that. Yeah, now you wonder, let me look further deeper into it. Maybe how is this being accomplished? Um, I use the example here of the mobility data space built by the German government to be presented next week. Um, some of the key elements you may have heard about is a connector that allows actual participants to, to, to become part of a data space. Or another way to look at that from a business perspective is you can join a club in this sense, right? And then there is some infrastructure required for actually data to properly be able to talk to each other, right? And, you know, and the, the comparison um, with, you know, traditional voice networks is, is not far off actually, right? So, you know, you, you've got to find somebody. How do you find somebody? You need a phone book. And so in, 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 in the data space, we have actually the equivalent of these kind of services. In, in this particular case, the phone book is called a broker service, for example. And, 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 and how does now all of that, you know, relate, relate with Gaia-X? Well, that is exactly what is envisioned by Gaia-X, right? So if you, if you um, know very little about it, let me quickly recap that. In Gaia-X, we envision a structure that has at its core something that is called federation services. And then we have certain activities that enable the connection with existing, with existing infrastructure such as hyperscaler environments or new infrastructure such as edge, right? That's down and up. Up, we will, we will see something as a data space to connect and to enable new mobility solutions. That is the intermodal example that, that I have. So today, it is it is it is prohibitive actually to 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 implement 
um, a dedicated uh, system. The idea is that we create an infrastructure, we create capabilities below that will more easily enable these kind of these kind of new new mobility models. And if you want to do this today, if you want to ensure data sovereignty today, well, at this point, GAIA-X is mostly about paper. Right. So we have specifications, and as we speak, uh, there is a big tender out there where paper is being converted into software assets. But you, you, you wonder, so how come that next week at ITS World Congress, companies will be presenting uh, data spaces uh, that, are, that, 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 that are corresponding with GAIA-X, with data sovereignty requirements? How do they do it? Well, they use IDS, they use IDS technology. So if you want to do Gaia X today, you're going to use IDS technology. So and that is now and that is now that is now the perfect link actually to 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 invite Sebastian actually to join the conversation here um, because by now you probably have arrived at that same question and that is okay. So uh, if today if I want to do IDS I, or Gaia X, I use IDS. And the question is, how will the future evolve? Actually, right? And what's going to happen? What's going to happen to a data space that is starting with IDS today into the future? Actually, right? And so, and and we thought it would be interesting actually now to to open up and and invite actually Sebastian actually to join it. Thank you so much, uh, yeah, for having me. Uh, yes, and, and great question to start. And of course, uh, you start with the hardest questions of all. So I'm not pretty sure if uh, the remaining 30 hours will be sufficient for that. Um, but, but in general, I completely agree. Uh, if you want to start with uh, digital and data sovereignty, IDS is definitely a great starting point. And if we compare both, I mean, you had this great picture with, so with the X of Gaia X and the Federation services inside. Uh, well, we have to step a little bit back um, from from terms and uh, think about requirements. What do we have? What do we need? And uh, we see that what Gaia X states as federation services is exactly the same that we state in IDS as essential and base services. So some services that enable a data space instance or a federation in Gaia X. Uh, so you need some base services that enable this. And this is basically digital identities. So uh, of course, Chris, we always state that you are Chris Langdon. Um, but I'm not pretty sure right now. You have never proven this to me. I mean, I've got an email of you. I saw your business card. Uh, but maybe it's time to, that you prove it to me. And uh, by the way, are you really an employer of uh, an employee of Deutsche Telekom? I don't know. Uh, but I could be sure because you can prove it to me. You have an identity card. Uh, you maybe have a PKI card from your uh, from your employer, and so you can prove it to me. And this is what we call claims. And these are really important features, important requirements that both systems, GAIA-X and IDS state, and they use the same principles. So technology-wise, there is a difference today, um, but I'm pretty sure that we can mitigate this, and we can, of course, come back to this a little bit later on, and, but it's the same principle. I have to know who you are and what are your claims, how trustworthy are you? Are you really an employer of a company XYZ? Are you able to sign something for your company, and so on and so forth? So this is an important feature. Uh, and then, of course, what you also mentioned, so the brokerage or the federated catalog of GAIAX. So I have to somehow show my services, my data from IDS side or my infrastructure services that I have in GAIAX. I have to be able to publish it. And the principle here is always self-declaration, self-description. I, myself, can describe what can I do, what can I offer. And there is, again, a claim inside, so someone that can prove that it is really the truth. And these are the core principles. And to do so, to make trustworthy claims, you need something like a compliance proof by someone or something, driven by technology, driven by trustworthy parties or whatever. So we share the same principles, and then it spreads up. While IDS is focusing really on sharing data and making data available to process, uh, GAIA-X focuses on the processing and on the data storage. So this is really the focus here. And again, you need the sovereign decision in both directions. So from IDS side, who is the one that I'm going to share my data with or from whom am I consuming data? Uh, and then if I want to give it into a cloud infrastructure, into a an infrastructure with a separated uh, separation of concerns and duties and roles. Uh, so am I willing to do that? And if so, under which jurisdiction? 
uh, under which terms and conditions and so on and so forth. And these are the core features inside. And this is beyond technology, really a shift in mindset um, because we have to understand that new data economy, new data usage and uh, data service scenarios differ from the, uh, how we are doing it today. The business models change. And this is a change in mindset that we all have to do. And then, of course, we have to provide the technology. And I think we are on a good track in all the projects. And the use case projects are like that, mobility, mobility, data space, or Katina X, you also mentioned this, and a lot of other use cases. In Germany, all over Europe, all over the world, we are working on this. And then we can deliver technology standards from the bottom line. Yeah, so the, the, the look, involved being involved in this right so we do start with ids right and and the, the question there is is okay so what will tomorrow look like right and and i think what i hear you saying is is actually that what we what what gaia x actually can do is can take it further in a sense right so so it can maybe even for lack of a better term build on actually ids and help particularly in, in those important areas that, that you had mentioned, such as description, right? You know, the self-description, you know, you know, would that be, would that be, the, you know, a valid view on this? How Gaia-X and IDS will play out in the future? Yes, definitely. So you're looking from two different perspectives. On the one hand side, you want to share data and you want to make use out of data. You want to put value into data and data is only valuable if you can use it. And this is the IDS story that we've all been telling for, for years and years. Um, but then there are scenarios when you really get value out of data, when you combine data from different sources and make a, a bigger model out of this. So AI is, of course, one of the most important models that everyone is talking about, but also your example with mobility. Of course, I would love to have the single app that could use all of my data and can suggest me, Sebastian, today you have to travel to Berlin and the weather is fine. So you would love to go by bicycle to the train station, then take the train to Berlin and then there is an e-scooter laying around. Um, oh, but I see the train is delayed right now and maybe you can't use the e-scooter, you have to use the taxi anyway and there is a shuttle service. So um, that could only be done if you can assess the data and if you can really combine the data. then in one platform on one platform ultimately somewhere you have to bring the data together and this is where the cloud platforms come into the game you need a single trustworthy platform where you can combine data from different sources from different participants but under certain rules and conditions as you said i want to be in control who uses my data for what purposes am i willing to get a benefit so get the e-scooter cheaper because they know where i'm traveling and so on or i don't want to uh, let the companies know that I am again Sebastian and using again the same e-scooter and so on. I have to be uh, the one who decides on this for my personal data, but also for my company data. And then the cloud platforms come really into the place. And uh, there again, we have to reuse the same principles, usage policies of data, uh, of services. How can my data be used together with data also for my competitors uh, when I'm in a B2B scenario? Um, think of the typical scenario, collaborative condition monitoring. If the vendor of machines could get all the data from all his customers, which are competitors, by the way, and combine them, then it would be for the benefit of it all. But you have to trust the cloud platform that processes all the different data or choose different technologies. Very cool, very cool. I mean, you, you, you've been hitting on you've been hitting on two two important concepts, right? That that, that we went into in coming coming bottom up so to speak through the use cases and you know the, the one is the identity is identity and the other one is the usage policies you know that that the, the instrument that that kind of ensures that i can maintain control once i decide to actually exchange data make data available into a data space um, I mean, if you don't mind, I, I, I would I would pick on that identity one, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and are, are there any are there any suggestions? Are there any thoughts? Um, I mean, ideally, would we also have a federated system? That that, that has been look, identity is a challenge today. You know, it, it is right. Mm -hmm. and even within within a big company, you know, different systems. You know, each system has a different identity, and, and so um, that that hasn't been solved in many other areas either, right? And and, and, I, and I think we, we may just um, overload this or the expectation may be too high actually to think that out of the blue uh, maybe we have 
the identity solution or solve the identity problem that we haven't solved in other environments actually, right? And so what is so what would you your perspective maybe you're the architect actually. So what, what is your perspective actually on that? Um, how do we deal with identities in data spaces? Well, well, the problem description you gave is perfectly fine. Uh, so we need it, but we don't have it. Um, but let's get started with the thing that we do have and can use. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are systems out there that are reliable, that are in industrial practice, uh, that can solve this problem. Um, but it's not as good as we wish them to be. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, we always talk about PKI infrastructures with uh, those cool digital certificates, um, but it's a rather centralized approach. And uh, so this is, of course, a challenge here. We want to have something decentralized that is easily scalable and so on and so forth. But those systems are currently not in industrial practice. Um, and then we come up with, for example, this is what everyone is currently referring to, uh, SSI, DIDs, digital identities. So a very new, cool topic. But honestly, it's under development. It's, from my perspective, the right path. Um, but we are in heavy discussions today. Recently, there was uh, the decision by the W3C to uh, finalize the specification or the recommendation for the DIDs. And then there was this big answer by Mozilla. Um, they said, well, blockchains are considered to be harmful for sustainability. Hmm. Well, and of course, I don't want to open this here in this call today, but we have serious issues there today. It's not completely solved. So what I just see, what we have to do is we have to be very aware of the problem and we have to find a solution. But starting for use cases like you have, I mean, you have use cases that want to start today into practice, um, but not with a technology that is not really ready today. So start with systems that are in the industrial practice today to enable use cases, but make them open enough so that we can do the shift later on to new technologies. This will evolve over the future. And also DIDs will not be the solution for the next 100 years. So the next solution will come up. So. And there as an architect, I would say, so let's split the concept that we need. So I need an identity uh, that is somehow proven. And we have those claims that have to be proven somehow. And then let's see how we can build it in technology and uh, having a certain layer of abstraction in between so that we can switch technologies later on uh, as required and as, a, a, and as available. That's my personal perspective on this. And of course, it's a very short perspective. We could discuss this for hours, I think. Yeah, I think what I hear is actually something that 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 you mentioned earlier, and that is that is probably a, you know a change in mind shift, right? And it's clearly you know the big picture, the way I I, I you know drew this picture that we have to reverse how we deal with data. That is a mind shift, right? You know, people to mind, 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 mind to distribute it. That makes few people uncomfortable with growing up differently. I, you know, I think, and here too, I, I, I hear I, what, what I think I hear is, is, and I can probably relate to it because I've been spending now the last 25 years in Southern California in a different cultural setting. There is so just do something, right? Um, what, what, what I often see here in projects is, is really a waterfall mind shift. We got to think it everything through to the last detail before we get started. I think, right? And and, 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 and so doing something actually, doing something, create incremental benefit, and then let that benefit then pull essentially the next step. I think that's what I hear in there. And, but, but that is an important message actually to endeavors that are starting with data spaces actually, right? So don't expect actually it's the final solution of like you pull it off the shelf, shrink back package, open it, plug it in, and there it is actually, right? It is something that will evolve because we haven't solved some of those problems here. So, so I, you know, I think that's what I've heard actually, right? That is kind of consistent with, you know, the mind shift argument that you had. And let me, be, before the time runs out, let me though also ask you about the usage policies, right? You know, they, they are, and, and coming now from bottom up, the problems, they haven't been properly addressed yet. That, that, that is what I, that, that is my understanding. It may be because people have to be more comfortable with it, right? But however, they are ultimately a key element because the data, the rights to the data is the distinction, right? You know, as a telco company, we've been we've been handling with voice dial tones, move to video dial tones. Now I like to say that's the data dial tone. And the distinction is that they're right attached to data and they have to be dealt with actually. And here is a technology that is interwoven with proven legal instruments and it all comes together in the concept of usage policies. Can you elaborate maybe on that, what, what your perspective is going forward? Um, 
Yes. So again, uh, a problem that is not completely solved. Uh, so in, especially in IDS, we always talk about this usage policies that can be really enforced in technology. So I can clearly state what I want to uh, be done with my data and uh, we can enforce all those things in technologies. Well, it's not here today, everything. Uh, some things, yes, some will be uh, available very soon and some will take time. Um, but this is ju just a general remark. But this is an important thing because uh, we are as persons, as citizens, as companies, we have to understand how can we deal with such things with uh, with data rights. And we have to understand this um, so that I can have this sovereign and self-determined decision. What can be done with my data or not? I mean, there are easy things that I can, uh, can, I can decide. For example, I use Facebook or I don't use Facebook. That's an easy decision. Um, and I can understand the, the benefits of being on Facebook or not being on Facebook. That's what's understandable to me. Uh, but what about, for example, my health data as an uh, other example, or my mobility data? Am I really willing to share all my data with someone else? And what, what what's in for me? Um, again, easy example is uh, Apple Maps or Google Maps. They are using my data. It's for free. I don't pay for the service, but I can use it for free. But they use my data also, again, for my benefit, because I can see where a traffic jam currently occurs, and they can offer me a better route then. So, but I'm not really at the point to decide what can be done with my data or not. I can use a service or I can't use a service. And this is something that we do have to understand. I mean, most of us aren't lawyers, so we can't express really what do we want to be done with our data uh, on a legal basis, sign a contract or create a contract. Dear Google, you may use my data or dear Deutsche Telekom, you may use my data yeah. uh, for that purpose or not. And most of us are not computer scientists that can express it really in a formal language so that a computer can enforce it. But we have to understand this. All of us, we have to understand that we get into the decision point and get back from whitelisting. I only allow my data to be used for this certain use case. You may use my data only for this webinar. You are not allowed to put it on YouTube, whatever. Back from whitelisting and towards something like blacklisting or more fine granular expression. So I can really express what can be done with my data in a way that it opens also for new business models. So if I can only say my data may not be used for military use, but for everything else, well, perfect. Then some cool computer scientists, data scientists can come up and develop cool new business models, great new services for me, for everyone else. And this is really something that we do have to understand and where we have to do some work. We have to start with the easy things that all of us understand and we need something like templates, clear stories where I have to be in control of my data uh, and where it's possible and where it's not possible. And this is an important thing that we have to work on and then build on technologies, build on systems uh, that can implement this or cannot implement this so that I'm still in the position to decide, am I going to use this system because it's making something good with my data or I won't use the system because it doesn't fit to my requirements for data. Did I answer your question, Chris, or did I talk about yeah, something completely yeah, yeah, different? Yeah. No, no, no. That 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 is. Uh, I I think it is spot on. And and I think again, what I hear is actually, uh, and, and it might and it may sound you know simple or I may simplify it, but it's just like just like the world we live in today. Actually, right? We can have all kinds of contracts. Actually, right? There is freedom, right, to do it, right? And 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 so we'll be we'll be similar in data spaces too, right? So we'll have we'll have that opportunity actually to design whatever type of contract we feel comfortable with. Right or our investors or whoever, right? And but but the good news is also you know maybe linking it to my starting point is the I and that that's where I see the value of IDSA is actually you, we're not starting from scratch. I mean you know there we already have actually solutions, right? So I think there are 14 categories I think and mm -hmm. uh, I think there are eight ones they they also offer enforcement in, in a sense that I mean I've been I've, I've been trying that also between you know connector to connector. You know the multi-time usage, and if you set multi or n to one, well, guess what? You can retrieve the data on the one end of the connector only once. So it does work. So there is even, you know, with some policies, there is even some technical, you know, enforcement happening as we speak today. That, that you know, that is possible. But beyond it, yeah, it is just like, just like you know, the business space we've all grown up, and you know, anything is is apparently possible. Right. Did I summarize yeah, that the, properly? <laughs> yeah, yes, I, yes, I, 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 I don't think so. Um, but it's really about uh, one important thing is that as we are growing up, um, so this is something new that we are working on and we all have to understand this. I mean, if I go to a bakery 
and buy a bread, for example, or get some ice cream at the store. Um, yeah. Then I have a legal contract because I buy something and there is a legal contract, an implicit legal contract. And we all know that because we've been that all our lives. It's used to us. But now we come up with something really new. And that's why I say we have to understand this, how it happens, and we have to get used to it. So it's something normal. A few years ago, we all muttered around for GDPR, so and so cookie consent. I have to always give my cookie consent. I still don't like it. So on every website, I have to click on it. But we're getting used to it. We get all of us, we get to understand why it is important that we're getting used to that. And this is the important thing that the world that we're living in changes, not only climate change and shift in mobility, also in IT things are changing and we have to get used to it and learn this. Yeah, and just from an implementation standpoint to, to, to the audience out there, you know, trying to implement data space, the good news is actually, right, idea has been designed in a way that, that you can, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, actually, right? You, you, you can have AGBs, right? You can have, you know, contractual uh, framework for a particular data space, for example, as easy as that, actually, right? So, and, you know, if your lawyer knows how to do it, and, 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 and you can you can you can reuse existing infrastructure actually to 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 create a data space. Um, so that, Chris, that, that, that I think is actually and it's, yes. maybe yeah. have a one comment on this. And it's not only limited to to a few to use it and to build it um, for large companies like Deutsche Telekom or whatever. Um, there is an open source. Uh, so there are different open source systems available today that you can just download and use. So you. All of you, you can build a data space based on open source components. You can do the same thing like large companies like Deutsche Telekom do. Every small and mid-sized company can get started with open source components and build own data spaces or step into data spaces. Don't want to accuse you, Chris, or Deutsche Telekom. I think you got the point. So it's really built on open source and everyone can step into it. And this is important that we all get used to that. Yeah, that, that that may actually be worthwhile repeating. Indeed, I mean, there's always this 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 concern on on the on the user side of vendor lock-in, for example, right? And and you can't escape the system and the interoperability issues. But here, it is essentially built in. It is open open source. It's open source, and it is in in inherently meant actually to be interoperable and, and that is i think the ball that that christoph mertens actually kicked in my direction right so let's chris don't don't just talk about maybe mobility but also illustrate how we have interaction with other you know with other spaces and indeed that is actually happening uh, it is happening you know in in several of my initiatives there if you, if you put patena for example uh, but we can also use GAIX for AI. That's another uh, funding project by the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs. Um, and, and here too, what we're having actually use cases from two different domains. One is more from the automotive, it's automated and autonomous driving. And the other one is though coming more traditionally from industry, right? And here we have it actually, right? We down to the part, you know, the, 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 one, the one branch, so to speak, is describing a part in a particular way and the other branches turn the same part in a very different way, right? And, and there, there, there are suddenly new new issues actually that have to be addressed. So how do we deal with how do we deal with uh, data space interoperability? And the good news is is that the, the the IDS framework allows actually to address that. So that is uh, maybe that's maybe Chris uh, and yeah. Sebastian. So, it's a perfect point in time to, I, so I don't want to stop the discussion and I won't. Uh, I just want to let the other participants of the call also um, uh, raise their questions. So we had a, uh, at a very early stage, um, we had a raised hand by Zoe de Linde uh, from European Commission. Zoe, uh, I think by the time being, you should be able to unmute yourself in case uh, you would like to raise your question. Um, so please feel free to do so. In the meantime, um, let's have a look at the Q&A section. So um, interoperability, Chris, that was uh, the keyword that made me now interrupt you. And um, let's get to a question that um, comes from Akira Sakaino from uh, Japanese uh, telecommunication company NTT. Um, it's about um, the interoperability between different countries. So let me read out the question. Do you think um, mobility data space needs to connect with users and suppliers outside of Europe? If we connect Japanese companies to mobility data space or Catena X, does Deutsche Telekom need to work with Japanese telecom companies like NTT? Is that a thing where also the 
people who create solutions have to work closer together? Do you have an idea how that will work, Chris? Yeah, I can I can respond to that really quickly. Uh, and, and Catena is a very good example here. Why? Because we're talking automotive. Automotive is a global business, right? You know, they're selling globally, but not only selling globally. Supply chains are also global in nature. So it will be immediately a global thing. And, and so, yes, it does make sense, actually, to look abroad, right? And so there there will be a true need. And then how is this being dealt with? Well, we don't even, you know, have to make things up. Just, just how are we dealing with a similar with similar issues like voice communications, for example, right? You know, the carriers are used to deal with that, right? I mean, you can make this is the one global product that probably works seamlessly, right? You can you can, you can call anybody from anywhere essentially. It will just work, really, right? Um, and and broadband, you know, the video dial tone more challenging, but it also the internet. Look, there's that interconnection, there's roaming. So there are actually that they're not only concept, but there is existing business, right? That is solving problems right in a way that well on one side the user has a benefit and then the provider makes a living off it and so I'm, I'm i'm very confident actually going forward that we'll see the same with the with the one difference though that i see the data business orders of magnitude more important and bigger you know in terms of um, value and that probably even uh, you know monetize so that's when you mega market actually coming up Maybe it's uh, it's also a good point in time to see if NTT Telecom uh, should cooperate to to create solutions jointly that serve the Japanese and uh, European market uh, together. Uh, yeah. So uh, another question that we have here in the chat from um, Bert Fadong from uh, Philips uh, is also about interoperability on another level. So let's uh, get deeper to the technical uh, side again. Um, the thesis that he brings up is, um, could you say that IDS enables bilateral data exchange and Gaia X extends this to enable multi-party data com, um, combinations? So maybe Sebastian, you want to take this one. Yes, I would love to. Uh, and basically, yes, I do agree. That's exactly the idea uh, of IDS to have a peer-to-peer -peer data exchange, bilateral data exchange, but open. So not only limited to Chris and me, um, but to all of you. Everyone who is using IDS can step into a bilateral data exchange because it's a, based on a standard, based on a common system. So uh, that's what makes for me a data space. It's always peer-to-peer, -peer, a bilateral data exchange, um, but driven on, on a standard, on a common foundation. Gaia-X definitely agreed. It's something similar. It's where really multi-parties come together. Uh, and have to process things together. So this is really a, a, a major point here uh, that we do also have to reflect in IDS mm -hmm. as well because it, it changes things um, because we came from the uh, hypothesis that there is one company, one organization responsible for an um, IDS connector and for um, working with the data. Um, and in the cloud, it's differently. So here is where we as IDSA have to learn from Gaia-X how those things can combine. And that's why it's so great to discuss with the people in Gaia-X and to get an understanding here how IDS can learn and can extend to such multi-party agreements and systems. Great, thank you very much. Um, then we have one more question also from Bert, uh, which is about, yeah, let's say user experience maybe. Um, so users have become very familiar with cookie notices and how you can selectively indicate uh, which of your interactions on a website can be used and for what purpose. So uh, would the policy management in a data space look similar? My opinion uh, or my hope is not, but uh, let's see what the work of you think. <laughs> Yes, may I have a, may, may I give it a start? Um, so I think, yes, it has to be that easy. It has to be really that easy that we can easily decide and say, so this is how it's going to work. This is how my content goes. Um, that's definitely the vision that we do have. But being aware that hmm, it's complex and there might be scenarios where we can't do it by such an easy form. Yes, I accept and uh, do click three buttons or only two of the buttons. Um, it's not always that easy and it will at some point of time uh, involve people from your company, uh, from your business department, from your legal departments to have really a clear understanding because we're talking about so many different things. We came from the school mobility example where Sebastian takes a ride to Berlin today. Um, that's an easy thing, but we have 
high valuable data sets that are really worth millions of euros and uh, so it might be a little bit different there uh, and not having such an easy standard contract but that's how business goes i think this is a vision we have to make it as easy as possible the user experience as good as possible but being aware it's complex do you Christo, have a different perspective on that no i i would just you know add to that and actually you know getting back to what, what you actually you know mentioned initially mind mind shift mind change actually it may allow actually for very different interaction with service providers so you know I, i'm letting you peek under the hood we've developed this intermodal travel planning application right and um it, it becomes immediately clear how you could be in much better control of your data and that you may actually end up having a digital representation of yourself that you totally control. So instead of having to maintain a profile page settings with the one provider, so Langdon, I have to do it with the one, with the next company, with the tier company, with the void company, with Amazon, with the, you know, everybody the same, that there may be an opportunity actually to have your own actually and have them literally knock on your door like how it is, you know, in the physical world that people just don't end up in your bathroom or in your living room standing next to you and, you know, <laughs> picking books from your shelf or something. No, it's they gotta they gotta make an appointment and knock on the door, you let them in. And 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 so we will may have it also a fundamental shift how actually a consumer can 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 manage data and give access uh, to to this data. Yeah, and it does work. Right? That's what we're going to demonstrate next week. So come and see yeah. us at the at the, on, on the booth at the yeah. ITS World Congress. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We also Please. will be there. So, so also, I mean, we are running a bit out of time here. Um, yeah. There are two more questions. Uh, I also will keep the roadmap part um, that we still have on the agenda very short. So maybe we can tackle these two questions very quickly. Uh, one is uh, coming from Jao uh, Moreira about um, semantic interoperability. So uh, Sebastian maybe, and also Chris, uh, if you would like to step in, can you explain how the IDS architecture address, uh, addresses the sharing of the meaning of data? So are there semantical standards that we are using at IDS or how does that work? Christoph, we have to extend this for another hour, I think. Um, I all right, I will, I'll, I'll pick the short answer. Uh, yes, semantic interoperability is uh, one of the most crucial points to really uh, come to interoperability, um, at least from a current status. Um, I, I started working on semantic interoperability like 10, 15 years ago. And when I showed up at companies with that, they said, oh, go away. Uh, that will never, ever work. That changed. Uh, people understand this and make really use of this. So in IDS, semantic interoperability is one real important aspect um, and we have our uh, semantic layer, uh, the IDS information model that describes the important things from, from an IDS perspective. So who are the participants? What kind of data uh, will be shared? What are the endpoints? How is the data uh, formatted? And um, what kind of, uh, and to describe the data as a tradable asset. So what kind of contracts are inside? What do I have to pay for it? And so on. So this is what IDS describes. Um, and then we have the clear linking point, the so-called vocabulary, so that we can extend this with uh, other semantics, like uh, an asset administration shell, for example, or in healthcare with HL7, whatever it is. Um, so it's really an important thing to uh, bring uh, semantic interoperability in this. We do our small piece of this puzzle, um, but it has to be open to domain-specific standards or to infrastructure standards like IAX is working on. That was really brief. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. Um, more questions are coming in, but I think due to time, uh, let's have a very last quick look at um, where you can meet um, Sebastian, Chris, me, um, Marcos in the next events. So let me take back the screen and um, give you um, insight. So Marcos, yeah, would you like to introduce the great. roadmap? Of course, yeah. So uh, great event. First of all, thank you very much, both Christoph, Chris and uh, Sebastian. Uh, as Christoph said, if you want to see more, uh, we introduce a new series of data space dialogue. We call it unboxing. Uh, data spaces and uh, the reason we call it like that is because it's time to celebrate uh, all the data spaces that are uh, out there right now uh, either operating or ready to operate and uh, we, we want to celebrate because um, ideas say ideas um, based data spaces are not uh, research driven anymore for many years now so uh, they're industry driven and uh, we want to see 
their success stories. We want to see uh, under the, the hood to look in uh, what is the infrastructure, what benefits they create for the ecosystems, and also cover things like interoperability with other data spaces. So we want to do this every uh, four to five weeks. Uh, we have the first um, events uh, in the um, timeline that, that you see on your screen, and we start with what a surprise, mobility data spaces. So we want to look into um, uh, mobility data space and also the MDM alignment and uh, continue with other very interesting ones like Catena and uh, SCSN and many more to come. So maybe just a very last thing uh, from Christoph, maybe you can introduce the next event that we want to do. Sure, yeah. So the next unboxing event about mobility data spaces will not only uh, exclusively deal with uh, mobility data space as a project that we run uh, here in Germany, uh, in Germany currently. Uh, we also want to take um, our time to um, show you what we did since summer until now, because a lot of things happened like um, the DSBA as a new alliance that is uh, just formed recently. And I think we should take uh, yeah, two hours actually to have a look at all the things uh, besides also DSPA that are on its way, talking about open source um, components, talking about a test that, that will be released quite soon uh, that you can download from our open source repository, deploy, start testing your own components or also components like the Eclipse Data Space Connector that is an open source project or the True Connector from Engineering. Um, that is available. So um, it's getting more hands-on from time to time and um, then the mobility data space as a project will finalize this session um, showing uh, where they're heading to. So uh, already a teaser here, they will go live with its uh, with their data space um, Q1, Q2 next year. So around about April we can expect um, the very first IDS-based um, data space to be on and uh, enable new mobility things. And Chris, you already teased that. Um, in case you are in Hamburg next week, uh, we, uh, Marcos, me, and also our colleague Julia will be at the Fireware booth, um, B5225. Um, so if you want to continue the talk, see more, uh, join there. And uh, if you're not there, 28th of October will be the next session to know more details about it. Yeah. Um, Great job. I think, I we're think just in time. Just in time. Uh, one minute over. Chris, again, thank you very much. Also, Sebastian, it was great having you here. And uh, we were following, uh, very interested in your discussion. Um, we hope to meet you next week in, in Hamburg, actually, Chris. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very nice. Thank Have you very a much. nice day or evening for our friends from Japan Bye. who are also on the call. See you around. Have a nice day. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you next time. Thanks to all. Bye.